Recording has started. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I know you have all all have joined from the different part of world. So take my uh, greeting accordingly to your time zone. Thank you for being here. Uh, today we are going to discuss four major topics relevant to the boardroom dynamics and its impact: virtual meetings, cyber security, board effectiveness, and ESG. And it's my privilege and honor to welcome our respected chairman, International Affair Committee (ICSI) C.S. Ashish Kari. So uh, here is his little introduction, brief introduction. He is the, also the past president of ICSI. He is a postgraduate in commerce and economics and graduate in law and the fellow member of Institute of Company Security of India, New Delhi ICSI. He is practicing at high-end corporate law consultants consultant since 2001 and last 20 years in the area of corporate law, organizational restructuring, corporate legal counseling. Representation and appearance for the clients who are into the manufacturing, production, processing, service sector, whatever uh, industry you can talk about, he is involved into that. And uh, almost all over the world, many states of India, he has authored many articles and held press and media brief for the magazine, newspaper, TV channels, and given professional lecture in India and abroad. Globally, he has traveled all the five continents for the professional assignment. He has represented. ICSI at the various international forums. He was past past president of the Corporate Secretary International Association Hong Kong CSIA and uh, International Association of 14 countries along with the India including Australia, Britain, Canada, South Africa, Singapore, Brazil, Kenya and USA. This CSIA is catering to the needs and representation of har uh, for harmonization of the best governing practice in all member countries aggregating to more than 100,000 member. I request him to please share his insight and it enlightened us. Sir, please join. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our esteemed guests, members, and professional colleagues who have joined us today from different parts of the world. Friends, on the ICSI global front, in last three years. We at ICSI has opened five overseas centers: UK, US, Australia, Singapore, and Middle East, Dubai. And soon we are going to open six centers at Canada. We have done first international conference at Dubai under the leadership of our president C S Devan Deshpande, which was attended by more than 125 delegates, including 55 travel from India to attend the same. We are going to have our 16th international fellowship program at France and Switzerland in last week of July, which has received very good response. And in Corporate Secretaries International Association, as Varma sir has mentioned, we are representing India as president in 2021 and currently as vice president of CSIA. In 2020, we have started this webinar series in across the ICSI by compulsion. but today it has become the fashion because members are very much interested to have the insights and we are fortunate to have the faculties from across the world so it is an absolute pleasure to connect with members of the icsi family from across the globe on such a platform webinars like this give us an opportunity to enhance our collaborative capacities and exchange our views our ideas on important matters related to our profession with the pandemic giving way to rapid acceleration towards online life digitalization and automation have taken a significant leap forward i am sure we all agree that this going to be the new reality and even though we have returned to business it's no longer as usual we are seeing regularly our board meetings general meetings are happening on uh, e mode only even the ministry of corporate affairs i have time to time has given the relaxations to hold such meetings and sending the notices and agendas on this uh, virtual mode we have adopted ourselves and our businesses to this new norm to ensure continuity in light of the unprecedented challenges but it has impacted the corporate governance structure including board governance data security data privacy and sustainable reporting 
Today, the new corporate governance environment is being characterized by an increasingly complex set of pressures and demands from various stakeholder groups, increased expectations of engagement with societal and environmental factors coupled with uncertainty about the future. These factors are complicating board decision making and challenging the traditional model of governance that have guided board till now. It is obvious that organizations are attuning their leaderships and corporate culture to a more flexible and tech-enabled ecosystem. They are diversifying across numerous dimensions including expanding the working hours across time zones to moving boardrooms into remote and hybrid models. However, virtual boardrooms are facing their own set of challenges. Directors sometimes finding it difficult to maintain their duty of confidentiality as virtual platforms are exposed to cyber security breaches. We know that the core of a successful organization lies an effective board, but the lag and frailty on many fronts have been laid bare. The integration of policies and the synergy between policymakers and other stakeholders is the only possible way for men of this fallout. As governance professionals, as company secretaries, it is our responsibility to bridge this gap between the board and the stakeholders. We need to keep ourselves abreast with the new technology and innovation and guide the board in implementing process that promote and sustain good corporate governance. In the quest to be socially, environmentally and ethically responsible, the organizations have adopted participatory governance sparking a new era of transparency and accountability. But this has doubled our work both with respect of responsibility and volume. Today's webinar on board dynamics and its impact has been designed to address all such issues. We hope that the stimulating discussions between the eminent panelists from across jurisdictions will help us all understand how we company secretaries can help our organizations, our clients shift to more equitable ecosystem that invariably affect the quality of corporate governance, reduce risk and improve board performance. Since we are aware that building boards that have a systematic composition with regular evaluation of competencies and performance is crucial in establishing the rationale for a strong governance culture in the organization. Let us all try and offset the potential governance risk by keeping pace with the changing regulatory and technology regime around the world. We have the faculties from UK, Australia, Hong Kong, India and the and our um, company secretaries and governance professionals from across the country are watching this webinar. So thank you so much for all the faculties, eminent faculties to spare their valuable time for this webinar in a different time zone. I know it must be somewhere late in the uh, UK or early in the Australia and Hong Kong. So it's very difficult for um, all the panelists to be with us. Thank you so much once again for joining this webinar. Over to you, uh, Varma sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and you correctly said how the world is changing, working style is changing, board functioning is changing. And the CS has the innermost challenge to bridge the gap between the different stakeholders. And uh, rightly says, thank you very much, sir, for your time and insights. Thank you. So uh, we have right now, we, as you said, sir, that we have the great four panelists today to discuss the topic that was mentioned earlier. So here is the brief introduction of all the moderate, uh, all that panelists today. So uh, I will go one by one. So I start with uh, ladies first, Pooja Sukla. Uh, CS Pooja Sukla is a lawyer and a company secretary holding membership of three institutes internationally, TGI United Kingdom, HKCGI Hong Kong and ICSI India. She has served a company secretary to various board and committee and various listed companies, bank and MNC internationally, operating in manufacturing, IT, mining, infrastructure, professional service, law firm, telecom, oh my God telecom businesses. Uh, uh, she has also served as a consultant to FTSC 100 company advising on corporate governance matters in India, Middle East and Africa region. Currently, she teaches law and corporate governance in Hong Kong Metropolitan University. We are, we are privileged to have Pooja on the board. Uh, thank Pooja for joining us. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, Mr. Uh, 
सी एस अभिजीत मुखोपाध्याय हिज नेम इज इट सेल्फ इज एवरी थिंग अबाउट हिम ही इज द वन ऑफ द ओल्डेस्ट कॉर्पोरेट गवर्नेंस प्रोफेशनल इन इंडिया ही इज राइट नाउ प्रेसिडेंट लीगल एंड जनरल काउंसिल ऑफ द हिंदुजा ग्रुप एंड इज इन्वॉल्व इन द ग्रुप वर्ल्ड वाइड लीगल मैटर बेस्ट इन द ग्रुप हेडक्वार्टर इन लंदन He is a board director in group companies in seven countries. Previously, he worked in India as a company secretary, chief general manager, director, general counsel in several co- major companies. Abhijit graduated in the commerce honors law from UK and India, and the company and the charter secretary from India and the UK. He has been listed in the top 50 legal professional, top 25 GC legal 500 most most powerful list, and also in the list of top 99. general counsel from 31 countries the hinduja group employs 127000 uh, people in 16 countries with a global annual turnover of us 15 million uh, uh, he was the vice chairman of the icc arbitration commission and a member of the steering committee in paris he is on the advisory council of ccls queen mary university of london and executive committee member of ivf confederation of indian industry uk and liaison officer of the international bar association of the global corporate council forum he has spoken globally and published article in many countries sir we are really privileged to have you on the board thank you very much sir for joining here thank you uh, the next panelist is mr dhawal gadani he is the fga cs and cgp is a qualified company secretary and started governance professional with a 15 years of experience in the financial service industry Uh, 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 in the corporate governance risk and the compliance side his financial service career has spanned mainly across the banking and the wealth management sector mr gadani held the corporate governance and the secretarial function at the hsbc bank australia limited and he is the company secretary for the bank he holds an mba specializing in the banking and finance from the university of the technology sydney and a bachelor degree in environmental engineering and is a member of the new south wales council of the governance institute of australia most welcome mr dhawal most welcome here thank thank you sir and uh, last not least mr cs uh, parthisam uh, kan uh, sorry uh, parvati sam kanchandan kanchindan so sorry to sir i my my sincere apology so a short we call him pk pk is currently corporate secretary and the chief legal officer corporate compliance at tata steel pk most significant responsibility includes advising the board on the governance and ensuring that the member of the board are ably equipped with the resource to the discharge their fiduciary duties and the corporate governance practices pk is also responsible for the compliance function of the tata steel and the legal requirement of the company in area of governance and anti trust corporate action of the, and the new venture pk served as a member of cii national committee on the financial reporting and on the cii national committee on the regulatory affairs PK holds a master of the law corporate governance and practice degree from the Standard Law School Stanford University master of the business administration degree from the Solon School of Management thank you very much sir we are really privileged to have you on the board thank you so uh, so now we all on the uh, ready to start but before starting our panel discussion uh, i would like to request our esteemed panelists for their opening re- remarks so may i first request <coughs> to mr pk please uh, can 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 you can you give some opening remarks thank you mr varma uh, first of all uh, uh, thank you ashish uh, for having me in this uh, conference uh, my gratitude to the institute of company secretaries of india and of course the international chapter uh, this is the first time i am uh, actually speaking in a forum that's organized by the international uh, chapter and i am happy to be here uh, and of course good afternoon to all my co panelists and uh, good afternoon to all the people who are actually participating in this conference um so this is a very important uh, topic that we are discussing esg corporate citizenship board dynamics and board effectiveness Uh, all of the topics are of course cornerstone for corporate governance and we as students and practitioners of corporate governance have to be mindful of these uh, topics uh, because these are changing fast uh, not just in india but globally uh, and of course i am a student uh, of corporate governance and i am also a practitioner of governance and my 
perspectives today will uh, reflect my orientation, uh, not necessarily the, the uh, opinions of my employer, but I myself, I'm an academician, so uh, certainly you will find certain of the comments that I make will be quite academic in nature, but will be coupled with uh, pragmatism and reality. Uh, as you all know, globally, the landscape, uh, particularly the governance landscape is changing and changing fast. Uh, and of course, we are no exception. Uh, from ends justifies to means, uh, we are looking at long-term sustainable growth being dependent upon uh, ethical approach. Uh, inform others on a need to know basis to transparency is the order of the day. Uh, we all know how disclosure regime is changing both uh, globally and in India, and particularly, the, I think Indian regulators have been far more uh, robust and far more uh, uh, into the future uh, in making sure that our uh, uh, regulatory regime is par excellent. And I'll come to uh, why I say so uh, during probably the question and answer session. Uh, domestic investors to global investors, uh, people working for large corporations, uh, people working for uh, uh, Know, knowledge industry uh, will know that you have uh, investors who are really global, whether it's financial institutions, uh, foreign financial institutions, or the PE funds. Uh, so obviously, you are actually now looking at uh, uh, governance, which, are, which is more holistic and global. Uh, from a compliance-driven reporting to a governance-based reporting, and I'm, I say so because uh, all of us have had the experience of uh, you know, drawing up an annual report. Uh, if you really look at the annual reports of 2000, uh, 2010 and 2020, the kind of information and the changes that, that's coming into the disclosure regime is absolutely stunning. Uh, it's no more tick box exercise. It's no more very compliance driven disclosures. It's actually extremely strategic. It's more holistic. And you will find more than half the annual reports today of global corporations actually being very, very governance heavy than being compliance heavy. So these changes are actually as a result of a fundamental shift uh, in understanding the purpose of corporation. Uh, for decades, our understanding of the purpose of the corporation was that it is there to maximize wealth for shareholders. This is where we actually learned a lot of the theories of corporate law and corporate governance, but that's changing and it's changing fast. Uh, the momentum and support for stakeholder capitalism has actually reached critical mass, um, both in India and globally. Most countries and companies now recognize the strategic need to have stakeholder-centric approach and to have purpose of the corporation that's more holistic and comprehensive than just focusing on shareholders alone. Of course, they're important because they provide the capital, uh, which is the fuel to the business. Um, in a memo titled, Further on Purpose of Corporation, uh, Martin Lipton, who is uh, the founder uh, partner of Vector Lipton, one of the leading global law firms, state that recognizing the underlying shifts in corporate purpose, a distinguished group of academicians from Oxford University have actually formed an enactment of purpose initiative. This initiative actually seeks to encourage the elemental constituents of a corporations, which is actually directors, management, asset owners, managers, and all of the other internal and external stakeholders to collaborate to articulate an actionable principle of purpose, which when applied to the special circumstance of each corporation will result to orient the firm towards a mission driven to generate both profit and social responsibility. And I don't need to tell my colleagues, particularly in India, how social responsibility or how much social responsibility is important. I think the Indian regulator is the only regulator globally, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, who has made it mandatory that Indian companies need to spend at least 2% of their net profit on corporate social responsibility initiatives. I have not seen this happen elsewhere uh, globally, and I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, marked departure from the uh, erstwhile corporate law understanding of maximization of shareholder wealth. Uh, Indian regulators, as I said, have taken leadership role in pushing the stakeholder capitalism to fore. Uh, the Companies Act of 2013 and, of course, the SEBI regulations 
of 2015 and the changes that have come from 2015 through 2022 predominantly focus on stakeholders rather than just shareholders. India is, as I said, possibly the only country to have codified few provisions in giving flip to the stakeholder-centric approach. Aspects like the CSR, uh, the directors actually owing a duty to the stakeholders. I mean, I have again not seen much of codified law which wants the directors to discharge fiduciary duties to the shareholders, to the customers, to the suppliers, to the employees, to the government and to the environment. India is one such jurisdiction which has actually codified the fiduciary duties of directors to stakeholders. And of course, the recent changes that uh, SEBI has made in terms of uh, disclosure regime wanting companies to adopt the business responsibility and sustainability reporting, BRSR as we call it. And these requirements actually go a long way in changing the culture and governance ecosystem. And I'm sure all of us are very cognizant of that. These underlying shifts in the purpose of the corporation and the governance framework will mean that all of us, uh, the corporations and of course the governance professionals have to focus on the long-term strategy and value creation, engagement with stakeholders and not just shareholders, be sensitive to the community around the company's operations. Um, and I'll come to this slightly more in detail when I take up the question and answers. ESG is no more a compliance mechanism now. It's turning out to be a very strategic intervention in the sustenance and longevity of a corporation. Uh, boards and of course managements need to focus on deeper intervention when it comes to ESG parameters. Externally too, institutions like the International Sustainability Standards Board is working towards delivering a comprehensive global baseline for sustainability related disclosure standards that will provide investors and all other stakeholders uh, with information about companies' sustainability related risks and opportunities so that it helps them to make a very intelligent decision making. I think we are at a reflection point, um, uh, but of course uh, it's going to be challenging uh, but exciting. <clears throat> Conferences like these, of course, will go a long way in creating the much required awareness because uh, I think the first is to be aware of what's happening globally, uh, what's changing, uh, and then be prepared. Um, I think the future of corporate governance is going to change, uh, as I said, because of two, three aspects, um, the shift from shareholder to stakeholder, the shift from short-term focus to long-term focus, and of course, the shift from just looking at financial metrics to non-financial metrics. Because of these reasons, there is going to be an underlying shift on the purpose of the corporation. Uh, that would mean that professionals like us, uh, particularly the company secretaries, who are the conscience keepers of uh, governance processes and of course advisors to the board, uh, also have to uh, adapt. We need to unlearn few things, we need to learn few things, and of course we need to adapt uh, and also reorient our, uh, our thought process to make sure that the way we advise uh, is more holistic, comprehensive, and actually takes into account all facets that actually touches all of the stakeholders who are going to be part of this governance framework. So with those comments, uh, I'm happy to kind of uh, uh, leave it there, and but I'll pick it up when I uh, take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, PK. Thank you very much. And uh, really <clears throat> now that the disclosure has uh, become uh, much more holistic than used to be. So uh, I, I request uh, Abhijit, sir, please, can, can you can you uh, uh, give your insight on some of as an opening, opening, opening remark here? Thank you, Raghavendra. Good morning from London. I will slightly correct Ashish said that good evening is quite early in the morning, 8.30. And uh, when Institute approached me, the, my first question was that, <laughs> what is the time? And they said that it will be 8.30 uh, on a Friday morning in London. We are enjoying a bit of a holiday, which is very rare here, because Queen's 70 year accession to the throne has been given an opportunity to enjoy the day at home. Be that as it may, I am quite uh, fortunate because when I entered the profession uh, 35 years back, 
the world was different india was different our profession of company secretaryship it was at the very nascent stage and like a father i have seen that how the entire world has changed especially in the legal profession as well as company secretary's profession and and role basically and it gives me enormous pleasure to see today company secretaries they are no longer acting as company secretaries they are acting as directors on the board they are becoming a part of the decision making process so therefore what uh, pk said i pick up from there that it is important that we should update our knowledge uh, to to make sure that we are completely updated now as i see it as an introduction since uh, raghavendra is uh, looking at the watch i can promise that i will not spend too much time on that but i want to just lay the foundation of today's very interesting uh, discussions as i see it that uh, the world has changed our profession has changed and like our prime minister he is very fond of uh, having acronyms i have also developed an acronym called t e r r t e r r t is technology e is economy r r is regulatory regime our entire profession has undergone changes in the last 15 20 years because of this three factors basically and i will touch upon them very quickly because you are all aware of it i will not say something which you don't know technology when i started 35 years back hardly there was any technology and we got excited when we used to get in fax the signed copy of a share purchase agreement or a joint venture agreement the world has changed now nobody knows what is a teleprinter and what is a fax now we are talking about the age of artificial intelligence and i have been attending i have been writing articles on this i get to know many uh, artificial intelligence providers but uh, and they they and many of them are from india and i can make out that how the technology has transformed and it has made our life as general counsel or as company secretary easy on the one hand and difficult on the other hand but we have to deal with technology and that is a fundamental tectonic shift that has happened in the last 25 to 30 years so i will just take a second and give you one example sometime back the university of oxford approached me and uh, they are funding a research project on an ai which can predict which litigation we can win and which litigation we may not be able to win now that's very interesting so the example i am giving because this is in which direction the world is going so technology has changed our life completely second one is economy when we started the economy of india was non existent i still remember that in 1990 the foreign direct investment came 100 million dollar 100 million dollar and we got very excited so many seminars were conducted at that point of time and now i am seeing in the last 3 years 232 billion dollars have been pumped into as foreign direct investment by the foreign investors like us that is the titanic shift from 100 million to 232 billion during that time the economy has grown 30 years back when we opened up we were nowhere in the economy ladder and today we are in the fifth position 1991 when i look back economy size was 285 billion dollar and today we are talking about 3 trillion dollar and there is every possibility as the prime minister says we will go for 5 trillion dollar economy in the next couple of years so these are all uh, the changes that are taking place final thing will be regulatory regime pk has very elaborately and eloquently talked about the regulatory regime you just think up 30 years back there was nothing called kyc and today we are struggling 
to comply with KYC requirements. We get foreign investors all the time. We invest. And the first and foremost question uh, is asked on the KYC disclosures. And I find it very difficult to say that the ultimate ownership is none of your business. It is our business. How the promoter shareholders want to keep their wealth, you are not required to know. But today that has undergone changes. You got to know. So my conclusion will be that the whole world has changed. Our profession has changed. The profession is at a very interesting time now. We can do a lot of things. We are being recognized as company secretaries. We are being recognized as in-house legal head, etc. And a lot of ingredients are there which can only help us in progressing in our profession. I, I, I am very hopeful about our yes, profession, provided we can keep up with the, with the time. This is my introductory remand. Over to you, Raghavendra. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and I rightly said that uh, now the company secretary is actively being, being the part of the decision making process and that change a lot about perception about the company secretary being a back office uh, people doing some compliances. Now we are part of the decision making. That's really changed that whole landscape about the company secretary profession itself. And I really like your uh, TERR. That's wonderful. I, I this this wonderful technology economy regulatory region. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your insight. Uh, may I request Mr. Dhawal to please uh, uh, please enlighten us from your opening remarks. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, all from from Australia here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity and and to the fellow members. It has been an absolute privilege to be sitting right next to a stalwart like Abhijit, sir. Uh, look, I, my my experience, and I, I'll 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 start by giving a simple analogy for the role of a, the way I see a role of a company secretary or a governance professional. Imagine yourself to be a juggler, juggling seven balls at the same time, trying to keep all the seven balls in the air and running on a treadmill and staying on it. That's what the role of company secretary has been recently, given the amount of changes that has happened. The traditional definition of a company secretary has evolved so much from being a company secretary to a proper governance, internal governance consultant to your to the to the boards and to the extent that working right hand in hand with management to make sure that the stakeholders, the shareholders and the board's best interest are managed. I mean. Like Abhijit sir and PK has said, a lot has changed in the landscape. You know, uh, the, the regulatory awareness has been, you know, heightened to to a degree that wouldn't have been, you know, wouldn't someone wouldn't have even imagined years ago. I mean, let's not even go 15, 20 years, you know, let's go back three years. Back in 2018 and 2019, having a board meeting electronically or on 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 the by the use of zoom or 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 a similar technology would have been a big deal covid hit and the amount of transition that we have seen even in our profession the boards adopting technology you know companies investing in these tools just to make the the, the whole process seamless is phenomenal and i think that is what i'm looking forward to you know this is what i'm looking forward to discussing today with this wider group is where is our collective experience? You know, how can we, as a company secretary at function, as a governance profession, work hand in hand with the board, try to juggle the board's responsibility, manage and assist the directors in meeting their, you know, director duties, and make sure that the quality and 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 I like the chairman's the chairman's comment about business is no longer as usual, which is nailing you know hitting the nail in the head. Things has things have changed. It is ever evolving, and and I think we as a profession are are, are those multitasking experts. The way I see it, that we we have to keep all the balls in the air. Be it working with management, working with risk, working with compliance, making sure that the the, the entity exists. I'll quote one of my 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 local colleagues here, Mr. Joginder Sharma, and I remember him saying that a company secretary 
exists when the company is created and is still there when the company ends. And he, 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 he and the company secretary, you know, manages the end to end life cycle of this entity or this organization. So I think this is, in my personal opinion, this is the best time to be in this profession. The amount of changes that are happening, the amount of changes that are coming are phenomenal. And I think, you know, company secretary from has trans, is transitioning from the, the traditional way to having a seat on the table, a seat on the board as a, a, a very reliable, robust governance advisor. I think I'll conclude that I don't have anything more to say, but I'm looking forward to this conversation progressing further. Thank you, Mr. Verma. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dawal, for your nice insight. Uh, really, business is no longer as usual, uh, as our chairman also said, and you were saying. And uh, one thing I missed uh, about Abhijit sir when he was talking about the KYC. Sir, I am I am trying to open a bank account in UK. I have incorporated a company there for my my organization. It's now one and a half month. We are nowhere. So that's that's how the tough in the KYC these days. So thank you, Mr. Dhawal, for your time and your insight. Uh, may I request Ms. Pooja to please. Uh, Please uh, share your views and uh, enlighten us, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ramaji. Um, I think uh, no matter which country you belong to or where you are working as a company secretary, your role is ever expanding. So I think when we started, we started thinking with you know, that kind of narrow mindedness that, oh, I would be involved in board meetings, I would be involved in form filing. But I think professionally, I have seen that, you know, there was a need that I had to understand in depth, uh, at an in-depth level, what kind of laws um, uh, prevailed around the business of the company. So I had to become a lawyer. Then I understood, okay, I have to understand the compliance perspective. So I have become a compliance officer. Then I understand, okay, there is a lot of Requirement from the accounting perspective, you need to understand the transactional, um, uh, the, the, the deeper thread of the transaction that your company is involved in. So, of course, I have to understand the accounting uh, aspect of it, too. And then dealing with the banks, uh, all the resolutions that you need to keep uh, with you. Also, you know, boards, um, their first port of call is always the company secretary because boards have, you know, that kind of trust. And as a company secretary, you are the bridge between the board and the, uh, you know, rest of these stakeholders and you are in between. So all the questions thrown, get thrown at you and somehow you become responsible to everyone. Of course, in, in many aspects, you also share the liability. So um, I think in my from my perspective, I can never say that this is the exhaustive role of a company secretary because it is always expanding. And I cannot even pinpoint that this is my job description. And for the next 10 years, I'm going to do the same thing. I cannot even say that for the next one day because some new challenge is going to come in and your board is, is going to require you to give your expert opinion because they are the ones who will require to, you know, take up the liability. And of course, since they trust you, since they are um, in a way dependent on your expert opinion. So you have to make sure that whatever input, whatever output you are giving to the board, it must be perfect. Uh, so I think this kind of um, perfectionism, I should use the word, uh, the way um, the, the whole of the core stru structure of the ISI, um, ICSI has, you know, kind of um, imbibed in us this has been really really helpful to actually become a company secretary from the course materials that we studied um, of course a lot has changed um, even if i sit on my desk now and if someone asks me puja are you ready to be a company secretary do you have 100 percent of the information i would always say no because i do not know what kind of notification just now some kind of regulator has issued I do not know what kind of new rules suddenly has become applicable. I do not know what um, new filing requirement suddenly I am a part of. So there is no way that you can always know 100% of the, um, you know, the, the circumference that you are a part of. It is always expanding and 
new kind of kinds of challenges keep keep getting into uh, keep getting thrown at you which uh, i think is a very good thing for us to develop i am not the same person as i was 10 years ago i am not the same professional that i was even yesterday and i think even in this webinar i'm going to learn a lot from all the esteemed panelists from different countries and uh, the the kind of exchange we will have um the other since we have newer and newer requirements always i think the latest hottest topic that uh, these days company secretaries um are generally required to uh, deal with is esg from hong kong perspective i can say that uh, this is of course for the rest of the world it is it is an older thing but for us in hong kong it is slightly new because in 2020 uh, only it became a mandatory requirement in hong kong and um uh, i want to tell you a little story a little bit of history how esg started uh, well well i think esg has always been a part of business world probably hundreds of hundreds of years ago you know each time you talk about your business you you should be able to uh, explain to your stakeholders to your shareholders how you are able to uh, you know uh, get that kind of profitability and the care or nurture that you have for the environment or the society or community um but officially it started in uh, 2004 when the united uh, nations uh, secretary general kofi annan he invited uh, he actually wrote personal letters to um, a lot of uh, you know asset managers fund managers asking their opinion that we need to draft some kind of system which um you know um connect the uh, environmental societal and governance part with the business models that you have and fortunately he received an overwhelming response from uh, various um, uh, fund managers and bankers to the amount of 6 to 9 trillion dollars at that time at as we speak on this day i'm sure it is more than 100 trillion dollars as of now and probably in the few next few months much more than that you can see how it has started so esg requirements they are not even 20 years old yet and 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 still we uh, we have uh, you know kind of achieved so much um, all the companies these days the the disclosure requirements the reporting requirements uh, i think if you even even at a company's at a company's level i would say your esg report that was there in 2015 you compare that with that of 2016 even the trajectory that a company shows at individual level the companies are growing too and if we combine that if we accumulate that at a country level i think we would see even much more of that with the launch of uh, the united nations principles of responsible investment and the other few guidelines that people uh, these days are using from the sustainable stock exchange initiative all of these are adding value so um of course people are kind of very happy that you know esg has made it to the board's agenda um but in my opinion i think the model of esg uh, percolates uh, much deeper at the corporate um, thread because you it has to be reflective in your internal policies that you have you cannot simply uh, you know print a policy get the directors to sign it and file it and never use it it is it is not a uh, stamp uh, on on a file on a document but something which is um uh, you know actually reflective in your functions the way you function the way your boards think and in your actions at the same time so i think um esg kind of defines a, a company secretary's role in in a in the you know ever expanding universe because we are concerned with the climate change we are also the uh, first person to reach out when there is any kind of litigation from environmental perspective from the pollution perspective um or switching over to uh, renewable resources what kind of board meetings we require what kind of approvals internal approvals we require then we are never it it never happens that as a company secretary you are not consulted when there is anything changing from the legal side you know employment contracts 
generally it is the cabinet secretary on on whose shoulder it always lands up uh, on so uh, so from the so s perspective of esg i think we have a uh, very responsible role to play we also have to uh, and of course from the g perspective governance perspective of course we are the holy grail of all the responsibilities Uh, the board structures your anti money laundering policies anti corruption policies so i think um, esg in a way kind of comes up how the ever evolving role of a company secretary is is even going to you know um, expand further and and how the boards are going to rely on you there are so many indexes now esg rating um, agencies and you might have heard of uh, MSCI ESG uh, from hong kong perspective we use hang seng corporate sustainability thomson reuters bloomberg dow jones um and i think um from professional point of uh, uh, view um with the hitting of coronavirus i think it has um a, uh, kind of exposed the clear divide that we saw you know we saw clear winners and we saw clear losers those who had prepared themselves from the perspective of making you know making their business flexible in terms of how how sooner how uh, easily they could go digital these companies have come out to be strong winners and those who could not cope up suddenly you know have kind of vanished so as from a, from the company uh, secretary perspective from the right from the birth of a company i should say before the birth of a company you have been you you get involved and after the company is dead you are still responsible even after the company is dead you are still a part of it so we have our responsibilities do not go beyond the life cycle of a company so i think uh, from every perspective with the, the technology growing our role is definitely going to expand much more and the uh, more and more esg compliance that, that is coming in and further maybe in the next five years there is something a newer version of a stricter version of esg that is coming in and um, of course um, as a company secretary you receive a lot of resistance too from the company itself and i coach the uh, chamber of listed companies in hong kong uh, they said when the when the esg uh, was launched in terms of a mandatory compliance they said this esg requirement is cumbersome so you can imagine as a professional when you know so call your chamber of commerce chamber of uh, listing uh, listed companies and your employer there's there's of course you from your personal perspective you want to offer much more but there is a there is a um, yes to how much you can do that kind of a fire whatever is the right way to say it uh, maybe you cannot go beyond what your employer is um, is wanting to do from the company secretary perspective we have to follow those boundaries and see how we can uh, deliver at our best i think to conclude i think the ever expanding role of a company secretary is 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 going to even expand even more over to you varmaji thank you very much pooja uh, thank you very much it was wonderful that you said esd and these days we all the company secretary we used to be part of the board meeting and esd and that diversity and the inclusion is the part of every board meeting agenda right now and one thing i noticed from your your uh, what you said the learning is the key and for us the company secretary law is the ever changing sub subject and that's so the compliance requirement so law always Uh, learning is the really key is that we keep learning every day and keep updated as the, the law or regulatory changes across jurisdiction so wonderful thank you very much thank you very much and now we are moving to the panel discussion and it's my uh, i hope my all panelists are ready for, for that and and i request uh, uh, that the, all the audience and the, all the viewer please please ask the question free to fill uh, ask the question and put your question in the chat box and uh, i and should not wait at the last of the last of the discussion keep asking the question as you and you, as and when you feel that you need to ask the question and we will reply while we are talking on the subject so thank you thank you everybody for joining so like uh, in the opening remark we all discussed about 
and the abhijit sir has emphasis more on that the trend of the technology and the artificial intelligence every everything so taking from there uh, right now and our chairman also mentioned about the virtual board meeting these days is that the need the virtual uh, uh, board meeting so the so demand for the virtual board meeting is there for the longer period uh, and many government has also recognized this need and provide some flexibility to the organization to hold its board meeting through the uh, video conferencing with some exception obviously for from the india perspective financial cannot be approved through the vc but a uh, covid 19 brought challenges to comply with these guidelines and at the same time it provided some opportunity for innovation also literally i would like to say that world has changed because of the covid 19 a lot so so pk uh, from the india perspective the role of board has been codified in the company act and under the sebi the, but this covid 19 has brought about a new challenge and opportunity in this days in this time how board are operating what are they doing to enhance their way of working is the role transforming can you can you put some uh, uh, insight on that Sure. Thanks, uh, Mr. Verma. Um, yes, uh, the role of the board has changed. Certainly, uh, the role of the board is no more ceremonial, uh, particularly uh, for students who studied uh, the Companies Act of 1956 and people who are studying the Companies Act of 2013 and people who have handled boards uh, in uh, 2000s. Uh, early 2000s and people who are handling the board now would uh, clearly find a sea change um, it's no more ceremonial it's no more compliance based the agendas are not just uh, noting of minutes or noting of compliance certificates or noting of circular resolutions passed or uh, noting of general notice of interest etc etc uh, of course these are important these uh, things are supposed to be done and the boards do it every board do Uh, and so does the company secretary bring up all of these things uh, before the board but i think uh, the role of the board has uh, become more holistic because if you really look at the agendas the discussions and the decisions that are expected from the board uh, you will find uh, the boards actually now discussing larger strategic issues uh, issues relating to risk management issues relating to succession planning issues relating to compensation Uh, issues relating to cyber security issues relating to environment issues relating to climate change issues relating to health and safety of the workforce etc etc so obviously uh, the role of the board has become extremely extremely uh, 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 you know comprehensive it's changed and of course as officers of the board we have to also change uh, we while we have studied the corporate law while we study securities law but i think our own perception of how the board works should change because it's more holistic the board is now discussing uh, every aspect uh, from societal to governance to risk to you know um, uh, you know board governance etc 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 so so i think uh, it would be wrong to say that boards would now be able to operate only on matters that are very strictly required to be you know taken by the board while there is i know that section 179 does give what the board should do but i think most of the boards have just gone beyond that and of course that is i think more uh, one is of course it's more voluntary there are board members who are becoming more aware of their duties towards stakeholders and also i think it's become a bit of a compulsion particularly for Uh, entities that are listed because if you see the listing regulations in india particularly uh, the listing regulations has actually codified the functions of the board and the duties of the board and they very clearly put out that the principles will override the letter of the law so the spirit of the law is more important so which means even the regulator is expecting that the boards should go beyond what they were either to doing second the very fundamental shift of focus from shareholder to stakeholder would obviously shift the role of the board while you cannot say that i am bound or committed to stakeholder capitalism and just discuss matters that matter to only shareholders so obviously there is a fundamental shift again and third if you really see what's happening in india uh, both the disclosure regime and of course the guidance that's coming out from the proxy advisory firms 
uh, do require uh, boards to become more holistic. Today, if you look at the proxy advisory reports that any of the proxy advisory firms that are coming out, whether it's IAS or SCS or ISS or Glass-Lewis, they all actually give how are you doing on your ESG parameters. It's not just whether your resolution is in compliance with the Companies Act and the Secretarial Standards. I think that's hygiene, that's discipline. I think the proxy advisory firms and the investors and the larger stakeholders expect you to be good at those. You don't get any more marks for being good at the Companies Act or the Secretarial Standards. You will get marks only if you are able to, I think, focus on the ESG parameters. And 50% of the proxy advisory firms reports today focus on the ESG parameters, which means the role of the board has actually shifted. So I think um, uh, we as corporate secretaries, we need to be mindful that uh, the role has changed and we need to really change the way we work with the board because at the end of the day, we play a very important role in making sure that the board discharges its fiduciary duty. Uh, if we are good, the board effectiveness will be good. If we are found wanting, in all probability, the board will be challenged because the officer of the board is not bringing up things which he or she needs to bring up. So I think we have a huge responsibility and I'm sure we will live up to that challenge. Thank you, uh, Mr. Verma. Thank you, PK. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, when we are discussing the virtual board right now, the puja, can we, uh, we, we, can, we cannot ignore the role of the company secretary. So, with your experience, what should be the role of the company secretary when board meetings have gone virtual? Okay, um, I think the first thing is um, we need to understand that um, as a company secretary, we need to, first of all, be clear that the difference between virtual and hybrid and physical, because um, since we have to comply with the regulatory um, environment, we need to be very clear as to which one we are looking at. And the second thing is after we know which one we are choosing, we need to know whether our articles of association provide for that. If there is any kind of restriction or um, additional requirement that we need to comply with, like quorum or any type of physical location of the meeting, registered office that we need to input or where the location of the chairman is, depending on where your company is registered at. Because if we are not, if we, you know, somehow miss that, there is, we are running a big risk, the meeting that it was not properly convened. So the resolutions passed in the meeting would be invalid and which would bring in, you know, a lot of uncertainty uh, as to the uh, the actual meeting that this that was held. So there are a lot of issues that company secretaries need to actually prepare for before the meeting, uh, starting from checking all the uh, requirements, regulatory requirements and so. The other thing is, um, uh, as a company secretary, like I earlier said, we, have, we also have to become lawyers, we have to become accountants. I think we also have to become IT experts because we need to make sure that the system uh, which we are using for uh, our uh, meetings, is it secure enough? Because ultimately, it is the responsibility of a company secretary to make sure that um, you know, it is properly convened, it is, uh, people are actually available at that time, they are able to join in, and those of them, uh, the proper quorum has been formed. So I think, it, it, it is required that we are well prepared in, in, in such things. Of course, virtual meetings, of course, they are convenient. Uh, there have been uh, rather studies which I was reading uh, which show that the attendance rate uh, actually increases if, if meetings uh, are virtual than physical. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to see um, how uh, voting would be done how, um, what kind of backup plan we have if the technology that we have chosen, if it fails, because oh, all the announcements have already been made if you are a listed company and you cannot go back on that. So um, the other thing is if meetings have gone digital, there is a, a higher risk of confidential, confidential information getting leaked or um, anything gets made public before the uh, announcement goes through the official channels. So. Uh, we also have to make sure that this kind of, uh, you know, cyber crime 
we are not giving uh, way to to you know hackers or so to uh, get into our systems and the other thing is um, since we have already seen uh, like pk mentioned you know working from home and and uh, we uh, you know we cannot take guarantee that all the employees of the of our company are IT experts. They know what they are using. They are using secure network or not. We cannot be sure about that. But there is a high risk that employees uh, from any department, you know, they, they're clicking on several links and, you know, uh, it probably automatically downloads some kind of data or so. And your the data stored in that computer or that laptop of that employee is compromised. The other important thing that from the company secretary perspective, uh, we need to make sure is how you handle the question and answers in the general meetings. So there have been um, a lot of incidents where, um, you know, I would say bad practices where questions were submitted were subject to a cap on the number of characters that were allowed or uh, the company said, OK, you only have to mail the questions in advance or you know this they, they prescribe the timeline of receiving the questions of course these are very bad practices some companies even gave unrealistic time frames of submitting a question because you know not everyone is typing expert these days you, you take up your time these kind of practical uh, problems um, we need to, as a company secretary we need to be very careful of um, since uh, during the uh, general meetings there are the agenda items could sometimes be very diverse. So the question and answers that we are taking from the uh, shareholders, if we try to group them together and you know ask the management to give a generic answer, and I think uh, that is not doing any justice because all the shareholders, if they have any queries, they should be properly handled um, and additional clarification rather, I think should be properly provided. And, uh, there were also some instances where companies chose not to respond to all the questions. These kind of bad practices can come in and uh, since meetings are virtual, there is a higher chance that they will be recorded. So, you know, you have all the proof of whatever you are doing much more than it used to be earlier. The other thing is from the company secretary's perspective, um, I think um, it is it will be a good practice if, if it is a board meeting you send all the materials uh, to your uh, board members much in advance uh, to make sure that if they have any suggestions, you know, it should not be last minute. And probably since uh, these days, a lot of virtual meetings are happening. And sometimes I should I should use the word most of the times the board directors are kind of from coming from the older generations. I still remember the last few listed companies where I was the company secretary. Uh, most of our board members were so old that, you know, they had secretaries to print out all the emails and present it to them, whatever, whoever was contacting them. So with these kind of board members, when they are sitting at home, you cannot imagine that you cannot simply trust that I have emailed you and that person would be able to go through all the documentation. So uh, I think this way you can you know that you, that person the secretary is going to print out. So, OK, why don't I give them like an executive summary so that the directors are um, actually um, uh, well aware of the items in the agendas? Or if you are sending uh, a second email, you cannot trust that secretary is going to print the same document again. So it is better that you in the second email, maybe you can highlight the changes that were probably suggested by the other directors. So the uh, second uh, uh, round, uh, the second set that you uh, circulate contains all the highlighted portions and of course using um, you know, any kind of appendix uh, so that if they want to see it from the accounting perspective or so or sometimes they even require uh, some uh, legal advice before they give out their uh, opinions so the directors are able to do so. So, wonderful, wonderful Pooja. So uh, that's one thing I noticed from what you said that now the IT team and the CS team should work uh, hand to hand for the confidentiality and the safeguard of cyber security purpose. So, so <clears throat> now one one more point that what I notice in the virtual meeting that uh, most of the director keep their uh, their uh, camera off and chairman is not aware what their body language because in person meeting body language chairman can guess that what is the body language of board member, how the discussion is moving forward in the positive direction or, or not in the positive direction. 
but uh, getting full direct full attention of the board member during virtual meeting is a tough task for the chairman and that's for the company secretary and abhishek sir uh, uh, abhijit sir please so uh, with your experience what you will advise the cs uh, uh what is your advice to the cs company secretary professional professional yes. so that uh, he can advise the board chairman to have the to conduct a smooth meeting uh thank you raghavendra i think before than that just if i am allowed two three quick comments now puja and yourself you have said that new laws are all coming and uh, we as company secretaries we should be aware of what are those laws now sitting in the sitting in europe and sitting in the uk uh, it may not be very relevant for india but let me quickly tell you there are two laws that have come here one is the modern slavery act now i am not supposed to breach the any regulation relating to slavery i mean it's a big subject we can keep discussing throughout the day but you can imagine that i am not allowed to bring people from outside and then pay them lesser what they deserve or i will not mute any kind of inhuman treatment now you can always say what i have got to do with my business i am running a business but that's a different thing that will give you an idea how the world is changing it is no longer your business your profit and your money it is more of societal like puja was also mentioning the modern slavery act not only you have to comply you have to put your modern slavery statement in the website of your company you have to give a statement in your annual report another interesting uh, i was just noticing in april the european parliament they have passed a regulation and it has been sanctioned by the european parliament and it's the regulation says that if you are acquiring a company then of course you will be conducting due diligence and one of the due diligence says that you are supposed to conduct the company that you are acquiring or the company where you are selling have they breached any human rights so therefore the breach of human rights you have to see while you are doing the due diligence so therefore again the question comes what i am supposed to do i am acquiring a company i don't know whether human rights have been violated or not and i will say that the whole purpose of bringing this particular legislation uh, is of a particular country where puja uh, is now uh, living so you can imagine that which country i am referring to now so therefore these new regulations are all uh, coming coming back to pk he has said something very interesting he said the role of board uh, has changed i mean i i can't more than agree because uh, i myself so far in the last 30 years must have attended arranged organized more than 2000 board meetings and today uh, i sit on the board of many companies across jurisdiction of 9 to 10 countries so i am seeing the one if you ask me raghavendra tell me in one line how you are seeing the transition 30 years back to today i will say 30 years back everybody would love to become a director today nobody wants to become an independent director you are seeing this problem in india i am seeing this problem around the world because the kind of accountability responsibilities all these things have been bestowed on the independent director specially certainly Uh, nobody wants to become an independent uh, director in fact in one of our group companies i have been uh, asking the executive chairman better you step down because your continuing as executive chairman gives so much responsibility then it is difficult for you if tomorrow there is there is an issue in one of our group companies we have got american ceo and uh, this gentleman was so much worried that are we doing business in some of the sanctioned countries so i was supposed to give him advice which i gave always and we have lost millions of dollars worth of uh, businesses because these were all sanctioned countries so what i'm trying to say what i'm trying to say is that as director these days you got to be 
too much careful, responsible as company secretary. It is our job to uh, really keep them informed what's happening. Now, your specific question, conducting a smooth board meeting, whether it is virtual or whether it is physical, there are many challenges. And uh, when I sit on the board, I can easily, uh, you know, bring my hat when I was a company secretary in India, because I was company secretary and chief legal officer in India of more than six companies. And these all belong to private sector, multinational, family managed, joint sector. Uh, so therefore, I have seen how difficult it would have been for the chairman to conduct a board meeting without the active help of a company secretary. And a company secretary becomes a very effective company secretary if he thinks that I have to manage the entire board. And that's very difficult. Now, this, I, this itself is such a big subject. It can't be covered in five or 10 minutes. But it is possible that a company secretary can play a very conducive role with all the board members so that the chairman's job or the CEO's job or the managing director's job becomes uh, very, very easy. For that, a couple of tips I want to give as uh, my role as company secretary. One is, please consider all the directors as your clients. It may consist of your executive directors, non-executive directors, independent directors, there may be government directors. So there may be eminent people. Please do not, I repeat, please do not differentiate between your working directors or old time directors and the rest of the four. If you can earn the respect, confidence of everybody, I will tell you, it will help your chairman to conduct a very, very smooth board meeting. My second tips will be that Please be transparent. Please be forthright. We are not supposed to play politics. Okay. So therefore, if you are very transparent with Raghavendra as a director, who could be an independent director, and PK as a whole time director of a company, I would like to be transparent. Whatever I tell to Raghav, I will tell the same thing to PK. I'm not going to discriminate. Now, if we do it, over a period of time, you will be able to gain huge amount of respect from the entire board. So when you stand up and try to say something in a board meeting as CS, my experience is that the whole board will listen to you. Third factor is that please do not be economical in terms of truth and the board papers. Whatever you are sending it to your chairman, whatever you are sending it to your working directors, make sure that a whole time director, whatever he gets, same thing, a non whole time director, an independent director, a non executive director also get the same thing. So this brings you, you know, more on par and you will be able to earn a lot of respect, etc. from your entire board. Fourth, final what I can go on, but fourth one will be be as much knowledgeable as possible. You see, we decide our fate. Now I have seen company secretaries always screaming, cribbling, I have seen general counsels, koi puchta nahi, nobody is worried about us, nobody is bothered about us. Now work will not come to us, you have to go to the work. I cannot demand respect that, do you know I am the company secretary, I am the GC, so please, uh, you know, give me respect. No, you have to command respect. And the way to go is your knowledge, your ability to, uh, you know, explain things, your ability to be a part of the decision making process so that people realize you are not only a law person, you are more than a law person. You have got overall visibility of everything. So therefore they will, uh, you know, at the end of the day in a board, nobody discusses law. Law is a byproduct of the decision making process that I can't do anything without complying with the law. Now, you company secretary, if we restrict ourselves only for law, we will not be able to earn that kind of respect. If we say that this is the law, but let me try to give you some decision also, it is up to the board to decide whether to accept it or not accepting it. 
Now this combination of both law and the decision and and the commercial aspect will really put us into higher pedestal. And all these things, if you have got a what I have seen as a director, and in some of the companies I am the vice chairman and also on the board, I have seen that once you have got a very good company secretary which has you know been able to earn the respect and confidence of the entire board your job as chairman will be quite easy thank you very much sir thank you very much and uh... Just uh, that, that, that you said that you we have to go to the work and we have to command respect. That was a wonderful line, and uh, and really is is uh, I have I have my personal experience. Uh, this help a lot to grow to grow in your career, grow in your hierarchy in the organization. Thank you, sir, for so, uh, your uh, insights. So uh, keeping this uh, virtual uh, virtual world meeting discussion ahead. Uh, Dhawal, uh, these days you know technology uh, play a great role in the virtual meeting, but at the same time, and we most of the most of these days the all all board meetings is being done through the virtual board meeting only. But this also includes the security breach uh, incidences, and that's the, in the manifold. So, and, and the second part is that that, that uh, noticed uh, noticed by the many company secretary that uh, most of the time uh, board members are not familiar with the technology. So what steps do you recommend that will help overcome these issues and uh, make the move from the in-person to the virtual board meeting easier and the fruitful? Pragvendra, I, um, let, me, let me tackle this question in, in two parts. One aspect we're looking at is getting acquainted with or adopting the tools that we ha have at hand. And the second part is making sure that the tools are fit for purpose. And when I say fit for purpose, I'm, I'm looking at it from the from the cyber security lens or, or information security lens. So part one, you know, question about, um, you know, how do you how do you make sure that or what steps we can take to to facilitate our board members, right? So I mean, the the biggest the biggest tool in, in in my kitty at this stage is is training. The 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 way technology has 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 changed, you know, training and familiarizing of of these virtual tools, so your meeting platforms, your paper distribution uh, platforms. I mean, there are so many providers out in the market. As an organization, and I'm, I'm talking as an organization, not as a company secretary, but as an organization, rolling out a tool that is that suits your needs or the organization's needs, fit for purpose, which is fit for purpose, is is your starting point. Training your directors in familiarizing. So it is no point rolling out a tool if you don't have your board's buy-in. So. The very first step is, yes, this is a wonderful tool. What help do you need from me as the company secretary or from our in-house IT experts to set it up for you and to help you guide through how to operate that tool so that we can make that as effective as possible and, and, and have that your, your meetings as effective as possible. Again, security is a big piece, and this is where it comes down to the management your cyber security team in your organization they have to you know be be you have to work with them to make sure that the the, the platform that is being onboarded or, or the 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 product that has been rolled out for the directors meets the cyber security guideline or meets the minimum cyber security requirements as such um now talking about what steps can we take again you know from a meeting management standpoint, look, physical meeting, you have your physical security protocols that, that you would follow. The game, it completely changes when it comes to virtual board, because I think I, I, heard, a, I heard a very, very uh, good line from one of my IT colleagues, and that is your cybersecurity protocols are as strong as your weakest link. And, and, and that is what makes the difference, right? So 
It is, yes, uh, you, you cannot do everything. You know, you have to leave things to the experts. But from a, from a governance you know, standpoint, I think what are some common practices that one can adopt for a seamless um, and, and secure board meeting? So I would say ensuring the virtual meetings are, um, are, are conducted through a secure platform, first things first. Second, the links that are sent through are sent through to the directors in a secure way. Some of the examples are some people or some platforms provide you the option of sending the link which cannot be forwarded. That's one security. Or there are certain aspects where you send the link, but there is a password that follows through a different channel using, say, the director's mobile phone text uh, facility of, of sorts, right? So these are some of the underlying controls. That is from a, from a meeting management side of things. What happens in, in uh, board papers? Highly secure documents that has the company's financials. Now, if, like, like Pooja and, and, and Abhijit sir uh, rightly said, it, 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 it's, it's how you convey that, that message, that pack to your director. Is, is it in a physical form? In a virtual environment, so say, for example, Abhijit sir sitting in UK is on one of my company boards in, in, in a hypothetical situation. I would not be printing and couriering the whole 300-page document to him. One option is email. But then it is up to me to make sure that that email channel is secure by putting it in the password protocols or, or, or that. Or the other is, well, why reinvent the wheel when there are secure providers out there, which are really famous, who provide that sort of a secure environment for you as the company secretary to up, up, upload those documents securely and restricting the end user downloading and printing it. That, to an extent, mitigates that underlying risk of loss of, you know, I mean, say, for example, if I'm have, holding a 300 page document on a metro on a train, and if I forget, that's my company's financials out in the market. So that I think is one of the uh, pro protocols from a pack perspective. Now, look, let's look at the action itself. You are in the middle of the meeting. How, what best can, can a company secretary do to make sure that the entire process is secure? You can you can sort of use restriction protocols. So, I mean, look, I'm I'm preaching to the converted here, but we will have presenters who would come into a meeting, present, and walk out. Now, as as a company secretary who's setting up uh, these meetings on, on on a virtual basis, you can control who comes in. You can control who gets access to that link, or that meeting link. You allow the person to come in. Once the, their, their update is done, you politely move them into a waiting group, a virtual waiting group, or exit them graciously with the chairman's permission. Right? I mean, these are some of some of the um, the common. Uh, uh, this is there is no exact science to it, but these are just secure common sense approach where you can help make your entire process seamless and as secure as possible. Again, Thank you. you know. As and when things evolve, I think there are bigger and better things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deval. And your your answer take us to the cyber governance because what we're talking about that the robust cyber governance uh, uh, in the organization. So before going to the cyber governance, there is a question uh, about the board practice and I, I request uh, PK to take this question. Question is, could you highlight few areas of the corporate governance or different practice followed in the boardroom of the world of our country? World over countries, including UK, Australia, Hong Kong, etc. Second part of the question is, and how different are they from the practices and principles followed in India? Okay. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Verma, for this question. Uh, so I think first of all, we need to understand as corporate secretaries, uh, we need to understand why is corporate governance important. I mean, we've been discussing this subject. We are discussing what aspect of corporate governance. But what is important to understand is, why do you need this subject at all? I mean, that's the most important question, and that's the elephant in the room. And corporate governance is required to protect investors because there's always an asymmetry of information between the investors who actually provide the capital and the people who use the capital to do business and generate returns. So this goes back to the classic fundamental theory of there being a separation of ownership and control. The owner is actually not controlling the business and the person who is controlling the business is not actually invested. So which means it's creating an agency problem because if, if the management loses the investment, it's the shareholder investment which is lost and not of the CEO and not of the CFO or not of the company secretary. So 
there are the whole lot of differences globally that emanate in governance practices is because of the fundamental problem that we are trying to solve which is the agency problem now world over the agency problem is not the same we think it's the same and we apply the same kind of solution to the problem it's like taking a pill the same pill say for example you take paracetamol for a headache you take paracetamol for a toothache you take paracetamol for something else it doesn't work it only works for the exact problem that it's supposed to be working for for the rest of the problems there are other medicines likewise corporate governance practices will be different in different jurisdictions based on the problem that we are trying to solve and that problem actually will go back to our ownership structure countries like the united states generally have a very diverse set of investors i mean if you look at corporations which are publicly listed in the us most of the shares are held by large institutional investors and hardly you will have a founder or a promoter running the company whereas if you come to countries like india countries like china countries like japan uh, you might find founders still being in control they invest they are in control which means in the west the agency problem actually is you're trying to solve a problem between the investors and the managers that's called the vertical agency problem whereas in countries like india you're actually trying to solve a horizontal agency problem which is the problems that can arise between controlling shareholders and minority shareholders it's not between the investors and the managers but the problems might be across two sets of shareholders one being a controlling block the other being a minority and that's where most of your agenda items as company secretaries we need to be a bit more careful to see whether are these discussions or are the topics that are coming into the board room are they being discussed <coughs> for the benefit of all the stakeholders or shareholders or does it actually create a conflict within the board room that i think is the very first check if you don't do that check we will be failing in our duty so it's very important to make sure that we structure the board agenda and call out the conflicts that potentially can arise to the board so that the board can discuss if you go ahead and discuss matters which are conflicted then of course the outcome in itself the decision itself will get questioned and that's where you have particularly for listed entities regulators wanting minority investors vote on transactions for example the classic example is the related party transaction where you know you can't have a related party vote now for example sebi did consider having appointment of independent directors being voted on dual basis which means all of the 100% shareholders vote but also the minority investors vote and then whichever gets more goes through but of course that proposal is still not implemented but i think it is prevalent in geographies like uk where you have dual voting you know uh, being important so it's important to understand what's the kind of problem that this board is going to discuss what's the kind of problem that this board is going to kind of decide and then make sure that you advise the board accordingly so for that we need to understand the differences that that's going around the globe second important thing is if you go to the west you typically find all of the directors independent except the ceo but in india you have this concept of insider directors you might have four or five directors who are employees sitting on the board then how do you kind of maintain <coughs> and how do you kind of manage the dynamics between the insider directors and of course the independent directors because the split is almost 50 50% so that in itself creates a challenge but also an opportunity to test your skills so that's the second most important difference that comes along and the third of course the way we look at matters in the board obviously because in the us the board is predominantly independent or in countries like germany italy which are european countries you have a two tier board you have a supervisory board and you have got something called the board of management unlike in india where you have only one board which means this is the board which will discuss all of the topics and which will decide all of the topics which means 
you as a company secretary or we as company secretaries must be able to bring up items to the board which really need their attention and then make sure that we get decisions that are clear, adequate, so that the management is not confused in how it goes about implementing those decisions. So there are a lot of, lot of nuances if you look at the, the global practices with respect to board governance. But of course, being in India, we have to make sure that we adapt and at the same time navigate the board governance in a way that it's most effective and serves everybody's interest, not just the interest of the controlling shareholder. Thank you. Thank you. Raghavendra, may, may I add one or two lines? Uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. What PK has said. I think I remember in 1992 when the Cadbury Committee's report came. At the time, Narayan Mirthi made a very interesting statement. He said, corporate governance is good business. Now, we people did not understand at that point of time. Now, sitting in the West for the last 20 years, now we are realizing that how profound that statement was. You know, I'm not getting into the value system and all. Somehow or other, uh, the West is more worried of the value system than uh, the legal system. Now, whether it is good, bad, indifferent is different thing. And I'm giving an example. In London, our group is, uh, you know, creating a one and a half billion dollar uh, hotel project. Uh, we are almost at the fag end of it. And uh, this will be up and running uh, at the end of the year. And along with that, we are developing 85 very high end residences. Now, it's not my intention to promote the business, but the example is that we have stopped taking Russian clients. Now, with, they may not be under sanction. My strict instruction to our group is that do not deal with them because everything is not whether uh, they are there in the sanction list or not, because it may not be seen by our Western partners very favorably. So let's drop it and we will be suffering out of that. We know that. Second example, you take the example of this war. Uh, so many companies, so many law firms are coming out of Russia. Now, it's more ethical based than uh, really something to do with law. Uh, last week, I was moderating a session of International Bar Association, and I found that angry law firms, you know, directly attacking the panelists and say, for you, these are all okay, theoretical value system, but how do I manage my law firms? If you ask us to come out of Russia, what do we do after that? What will happen to our lawyers? So corporate governance in India, it is still, I'm a bit sad to say, regulation-based, Whereas in the West, and as PK also said in the US, it is more of morality based. So you should be, you know, something like uh, above than the uh, Julius Caesar's wife. Not only you seem to be following the law, but you seem to be, uh, you know, being portrayed that you are the great repository of the morality of the system. So that is a bit of a difference between uh, Indian system or Asian system and the Western system. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I, I hope that uh, that uh, the, you uh, you got you got your answer. Uh, so I don't know who asked this question name, but I, I'm 100 percent sure you got your answer. So uh, continuing with you, sir, that, uh, uh, you know, we all company secretary these days uh, is looking after mm -hmm. so many companies and companies are spread all over the globe. So so this really create a challenge for the as a company secretary and compliance officer for us that the law and regulatory requirement and culture uh, etc of the east country is different from the another company so how to develop a cross border multi jurisdictional compliance protocol how to protect the director from the international sanction regime and anti bribery regulation having cross border application now it has really become some kind of problem uh, because you know companies have all gone multi jurisdictional say as far as our group is concerned we have got offices in more than 60 countries. We do business with more than 100 countries. It's really a big conglomerate. We have got 150,000 people. Group turnover has exceeded $18 billion every year. So therefore, 
and we have got 13 business verticals. Out of 13 business verticals, we have got 25, 30 different varieties of businesses. So it's really a uh, you know big conglomerate and running the compliance regime in line with the businesses is uh, very 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 difficult basically and it's very difficult to give an answer in one or two minutes but let me pick up one or two uh, hot items from the compliance point of view which may be of interest uh, to the people who are listening to this one is the sanction the other one is anti bribery why i am raising this because it is such opaque regulations all over the world that nobody knows what is the correct answer you look at sanction regime now sanctions are being imposed by us united uh, uk eu etc now do they have cross border uh, jurisdiction no absolutely not but then if you are uh, really doing business globally, then you will find that you will be forced to obey the sanctions rather than, uh, you know, say that it does not affect us. Take the example of India. Now, when there were sanctions on Iran, India used to say that, look, it has got nothing to do with me. I have not imposed any sanctions on Iran. So I am permitted to do business between India and Iran. But definitely the problem is that if you are a multinational, and I have seen this example uh, happening in many multinational. Now, if you are a multinational, if you are producing some product in India, and if you are trying to sell this to Iran by your Indian companies, like many Western regime wanted to do, the problem is that you will be squeezed. You will be uh, in difficult situation if you have got simultaneous US operation. And as you all know, Everything is not law. Basically, you will be hitting the, uh, you know, the wrath of the uh, U.S. Uh, governments. Same goes with EU. So, therefore, it's a very complex kind of regime. And then again, I come back to the same morality issue. Uh, in the group, I am responsible for clearing, uh, you know, any sanction-related products. And always, I always take the view that let us be very, very careful and cautious and let's not look into the law because law wise you will be permitted to do business with a particular country but then you may be hit because of your us operations or eu operation now the directors are very scared if you have got directors who holds us nationality indian nationality eu nationality then british nationality nationality all over the world now they are bound by their own regulations also. So it is not enough. An Indian director in a board say, I'm not bound by sanction. A EU director can stand up and say, but I'm bound by sanction. What do I do? And US can say that I am bound by sanction being a US citizen. Whether I'm sitting in India or Honolulu or Timbuktu, it does not matter. So therefore, the the role of the general counsel, the role of the company secretary, because, you know, they will always come back to you. That Raghavendra tell me, what do I do? What is your advice? The entire board, when they come to you, you find it very difficult because you have got directors who are bound by the, uh, you know, sanction regimes and you have got directors who are not bound by the sanction regime. So the overall interest of the business or overall interest of the company, you have to help the board to arrive at some kind of decision. So this is just on the sanction regulatory regime. Along with that, I will say, I, I have to maintain a great interest on in geopolitical uh, events, what is happening around the world, because ultimately your business will be impacted or benefited out of that geopolitical uh, study. So you have to be aware what is happening around the world and what are the regulations that are coming, like the sanctions and all. So therefore, I think you have to be on the top of the regulatory regime. And there are hundreds of thousands. We discussed about KYC. The whole world is integrated. We discussed about the anti-money laundering. So therefore, what I'm trying to say, it is not enough that you follow the, the, the letter of law. You have to follow the spirit of law. And that may call for even you know abandoning some of your businesses in the so that you know, you don't transgress 
the 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 legal system somewhere or the western value system it's really a problem take the example my last example i will give on the anti bribery when this act came in uk in 2011 lot of my indian colleagues told me oh you are responsible Listen, it does not uh, bother me because our indian uh, companies are not impacted by your so called anti bribery but i told them i used to give a very uh, you know funny example i said absolutely no problem you carry on with your indian business no no problem but would you like to visit uk and they used to say obviously <laughs> yes of course we will come to the uk i said you will not be allowed to pass through the border agency because you have violated the anti bribery act in the uk so that is the problem legally i cannot force you to comply with uh, britain's anti bribery law but i'm not talking even about morally a very peculiar situation will come if you want to visit uk and you may not be allowed because you might have breach some anti bribery regulations that the uk law now it is better that you develop your protocol you develop your system you make representation in the board that we don't breach any anti bribery law so short point i am trying to say ragavendra is that if you are running a global business and if you are running a global uh, compliance regime then your task becomes very difficult you are not only seeing your own indian perspective or the country where you are sitting you have to see the overall and take a view that is it a good idea to do business because i may not be violating or breaching any law but in the long run it may hurt us basically so that has imposed huge responsibilities on the general counsel on the company secretary then i will conclude by telling i go back to how to get respect from the board if you give a good pragmatic practical advice considering the you know psychology of your board members i think you will gain more respect so your biz, your 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 advice should be business driven but your advice should be law driven and to some extent if you are sitting in the world your advice should be conscious driven also so that the board can take a uh, you know view whether to go ahead with the business or not thank you very much sir thank you very much wonderful insight and that uh, and the sanction uh, regulatory regime uh, uh, insight was really really great insight because i face personally that then one issue when i have was i having the business in myanmar and that the lot of lot of issue have uh, happened when investor came came to invest in our company and that that happened so that so taking from there uh, moving to uh, uh, move to the other part uh, <laughs> like from taking here from your point sir that uh, uh, how to safeguard our board from the cross border implication we know that the board is the highest decision making uh, body of any organization and the effectiveness and success of any organization directly proportional to the effectiveness of its board we have many several example of the successful organization and the role of the board thereof and at the same time we have multiple example of the failure of promising company due to non effective board so uh, uh dhaval uh, may i ask you one question uh, no. what role does a company secretary play in facilitating the board effectiveness either through their manage engagement with the management or board committee chair and can such effective board meet corporate governance as well as the value creation challenges given that the pace of the business has seen an impact of the pandemic second point if uh, how is the modern day company secretary sharing this responsibility and what are the expectation from him um okay uh let let me go back to my my analogy about you know us juggling seven balls in the air and trying to turn on the trade mill at the same time i think both as such are continuously uh, in scrutiny by your your stakeholders including your shareholders you know your regulators and even third party suppliers so times like this a company secretary plays an important role in managing these various responsible as aspects responsible to maintaining the board's effectiveness now i mean 
I, I can give you some examples in terms of, you know, the board composition. So like, like Abhijit sir said, if you want to, uh, you know, gain the board's respect, uh, ask for work, right? And, and this is where your proactivity as a company secretary plays a part, which is, is your board composition. And, and this is uh, the caveat here I want to put is your engagement with and, 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 and buy-in from the company CEO and the chairman of the board because they are your best and closest allies in getting things across the line and, and, and making sure that the company maintains on the, in its strategic path, right? So coming back to the uh, composition, board composition is, is a key to the board's effectiveness. I mean, as a company secretary, making sure that the chairman's and the CEO's view on where they want to take the company, whether the board skills that they need as a collective are there in place whether there is a, a right balance of skills expertise diversity on the board that makes the board you know uh, effectiveness way more robust uh, the second thing is and again uh, it comes down to and i'm talking about the the new age board governance that is bringing in fresh perspective to the board right mm -hmm. that means not not discounting the, the value an independent director adds to the board, but I think regulators have stipulated a, a, a specific time frame up to a time where a director can be considered as independent. And I think that is where the board uh, succession plan comes into play. So to build this an effective board, uh, sorry, to, to, to build upon this board effectiveness, right, the board should have an effective succession plan. Not because the person, a, a, a non-executive director is complacent, but it is to build a talent pipeline so that it keeps assessing it, its, its ever-evolving need on, on, on where the board, where the company needs to go. The other point that I would make is the timeliness and quality of information that gets presented to the board. So for a board to be effective, they need the right tools for them to engage with management, for them to write, ask the right question, for them to have the right debate before making that decision. Because from a regulator's perspective, I think they, they would look at a decision being made by the board, but they would look at the reasonable basis, what interactions, what discussions, what, what <laughs> debate that the board have before making that decision. And, and the only time a board can have that discussion is when the quality of information that passes through from management to the directors is fit for purpose. From a management perspective, you know, they would love to see the whole universe and a whole MI and, and rack status for risk, risk uh, you know, um, uh, matrices and all. But then how does management compile that information into something which is directional driven. So basically, I'll give you an example where hypothetically speaking, there is a problem. The board's management says, dear directors, this is the problem. This is what we are doing to resolve it. From a board perspective, if I am sitting on the board as a director and if I wanted my board to be a bit more effective and, and, and demonstrate the effectiveness, my next question is agreed. There is a problem. Agreed. You put, you know, measures in place, but what lessons have you learned as management? What are you doing to, uh, you know, uh, sorry, I, I love giving analogies and examples. A boat, there is a hole, right? Yes, there is a hole. But what have you done to fill the hole and make sure that there are no more holes happening? And exactly the same, same analogy. So from a management perspective, the reporting that goes through to the board, for them to be able to make a, a, an effective, timely, robust decision, the, 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 the information should be result driven, something that sort of um, enables the board to have that robust discussion, fit for purpose kind of an information. Sorry, I'm harping on going tangential on a few other things. But as a company secretary, like I said, you know, continuously working with the chairman and the CEO to ensure the discussions that are, you know, focused at the board are in the right in, in the right uh, direction. Agenda planning is another another route where, you know, this is this is the aspect where you have the discussion with the directors and the chairman. 
even cross com, uh, committee chairman so the discussions with the risk committee or the audit committee and the board whether there you you are as a company secretary able to establish that connection that report that cross committee reporting that cross committee collaboration to enable the board make that effective decision and effective governance um and the last point and i'll i'll i'll, I'll close off with this last point and that is have a robust well structured board and committee effectiveness assessment process in place so all well and good that you know the board decides that we are we are moving in that direction but is that direction in line with the company's strategy are there regulatory developments that has occurred in the past 12 months or 3 years that that requires the board to course correct and how will how will the board assess that one of the tools is the directors being open and honest in their feedback on whether you know in, in the effectiveness of that committee whether they they receive the right amount of feedback from management i mean i am a big believer that you know even 360 degree feedback so in the board effectiveness assessment that happens engage your management your top level executive management to say this is what we think how the board is doing and and this is where abhijit sir has said the transparency aspect where you know the engagement piece where management is is frank enough and open enough to uh, approach to one of the directors saying sir madam this is where i think we should improve or this is where you know you tell us where we need to work more i think this this transparency and openness aspect plays a massive part in 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 making a board way more effective like like i said there is no exact science but it is all principle based and it is horses for courses back to you ragvindra thank you thank you very much uh, uh, thank you very much dhawal and uh, i request my panelists we are running short of time so uh, anyway we need to touch a lot of lot of uh, topic so uh, please please uh, 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 answer keep little short so uh, just i want to share one one my experience uh, almost 5 6 year back Uh, i was leading an investment exercise on behalf of my organization and during the dd due diligence i got a number of question belongs to est at that point of time i was so, oh, wow what is this although for the manufacturing companies and other company as a part of annual return we used to report to the government many of this query like uh, consumption of electricity waste report etc but receiving this query and the disclosure they wanted from us that was uh, very very eye opener for me i'm talking about 5 6 year back now now these days everyone is talking about esg and this is the one of the more main focus uh, 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 topic for discussion and every board meeting everywhere and as as uh, at the same time uh, the discussion about the company secretary role in ensuring the reporting and the compliance disclosure so so uh, may i request puja your insight on that like like i said investor see is esg as a future and uh, uh, and working with the esg data is no longer optional asset manager fund manager banks all are moving towards a more disciplined and rigorous approach to evaluating companies non financial performance however progress is still considered to be hindered due to various reasons can you can you highlight what are the main reason in your opinion from your hong kong perspective Uh, well um uh, uh, i think esg generally is good but i think it's insufficient because you would see um like i said there is a lot of resistance that is coming out from uh, the countries where it is in kind of i should use the word imposed now and uh, at the same time um if we see if we analyze the data we would see that a lot of companies are actually using inaccurate data because um the kind of framework that we have been given given um it is it is it looks like just another box ticking exercise and there is a big disparity between the actual data and how you are presenting the uh, esg data so this gap between practicing and preaching is making it all the more ineffective um as a result of which i think esg more or less is just used as a marketing ploy where companies are just giving up to information only to have uh, you know investors coming in to 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 please their regulators or their shareholders and 
the other thing is the ESG rating providers, if you see world over, there is inconsistency everywhere. Uh, different ESG prov uh, rating providers are, you know, their methodologies are different and there is no clarity on what kind of weightage is given to what kind of criteria. So which makes it even more difficult for even one company to understand what kind of improvement they can make because the criteria is throughout the world over, it is all different. And even the ESG scores, there is a big level of inconsistency. And from the regulator uh, perspective, I think the kind of KPIs that are given to us um, as companies, even the regulator is, is not very clear on what they want. Of course, because of the international pressure, every regulator in, in every country is forced to develop their own structure. But as of now, uh, if the regulator is juggling with, oh, is this right for my country? Oh, should I demand this? Is it feasible? Is it going to add value? The other thing is because ESG is relatively new, there are not enough ESG professionals uh, that can actually help to, you know, help you draft your um, reports or so. And ultimately, like I said, everything falls on us. So company secretaries are actually preparing those ESG reports. And this is an additional thing that, that we have. So at, at this point of time, there are no exactly best practices developed as to what could be a good ESG report. How can we learn? So people are just using trial and error method to understand how can we improve? What can we do better? So I think there are a lot of issues if we start talking about it, but, but highlight, I would say, inconsistency, inconsistency, and uh, not, material, not having material knowledge on how to present the data. Wonderful, Pooja. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, my last question on this topic to PK. PK, uh, from the board perspective, uh, can you can you give your insight that the, what are the ESG risks and how to ensure proper risk management strategy in place, and uh, how ESG impact company secretary and the compliance program, and uh, and uh, how are the ESG principle applied to the compliance officer performance? Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Verma. Uh, so I heard my co-panelists uh, uh, speak about the inconsistencies that are there. I think that's true. But I think we cannot ignore ESG. ESG is here to stay and it's going to become very important. And that's because uh, companies not just need regulatory licenses to operate, but also need social license to operate. And particularly companies like Tata Steel which is in the manufacturing uh, sector will need that social license to operate because the communities matter, uh, employees matter, customers matter, uh, suppliers matter, without whom you cannot do business. So I think ESG is now a reality. Uh, the sooner we appreciate, the better we are. Uh, and so is for the boards. Uh, if you think ESG is just another marketing tool, then we will probably miss the bus. Uh, whichever company thinks, the company will miss the bus clearly. And yes, while there are inconsistencies, geographies like Europe is doing extremely good uh, when it comes to um, uh, sustainability metrics. They are leading the way. Um, uh, you know, uh, the kind of regulatory interventions that are coming in, the kind of work that companies are doing, particularly industries that are hard to abate, whether it is steel, cement, etc., etc., uh, the kind of investments they are making to become more responsible, more sustainable, more greener is actually mind-boggling. And you will see, frankly, if you pull out the information that's coming out, whether it's on carbon, um, whether it's on air quality, whether it's on water, whether it is on biodiversity, whether it's on diversity and inclusion, uh, whether it's on training your human resources on safety matters, um, whether it's on, uh, you know, um, employing different skill sets, uh, there is a lot of information that's coming out and Indian companies will come out. I would just uh, request everybody to, uh, you know, wait for the annual reports to come out. You will see a stark difference between what was disclosed in 2020, 21 and 22 and 23 is going to be even better. So that's point number one. Point number two, the boards are going to lead the way because ESG as a topic is not just going to work bottom up, it's going to be top down. 
because at the end of the day, the boards have to own up this because it does have a direct impact on the sustainability and the future of the corporation. So the full board, while the full board may not have the time, you will have subcommittees like the sustainability or the CSR and the sustainability committee or in manufacturing industries, you will have subcommittees which will look at safety, health and environment, which will actually drive some of these ESG interventions. Plus, it's going to become a risk committee subject because the ESG, the climate change risk, and that's reality, the climate change, whether it's physical risk or transition risk, it's a reality. And most of the risk committees would want to discuss What's the company going to do? What's the management thought process on how do they want to tackle the physical risk and the transition risk? And what's the kind of uh, disclosures that management intends to make? Because today, if you want to raise capital, the investing community, whether it is in the equity side or the debt side, they're actually demanding interventions from you. They're wanting to know what your in initiatives are. So I think, the boards will look at ESG far more seriously than what it was previously. Yes, there is a learning curve. All of us are learning. But I think the learning curve is going to be fast and I think we will mature faster. So that's what uh, is my view. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful PK and a nice uh, insight. And this really the fact that like I mentioned that uh, uh, investor when I getting some investment asked for the six, seven year back that, that there's so many disclosure and these days also is coming up and the regular in my my routine in every board board meeting, I pretend that the requirement that they said that these are the disclosure, what are the and diversity and inclusion also at the same time. So this is the reality that I, I totally agree with you. And uh, now moving to uh, uh, Dhawal, I, I know that you have the time constraint, but uh, just can you bear with us for, for 10 minutes more? Any Absolutely. question, uh, audience, please uh, keep asking question. Uh, if I have any question, please, uh, please put it in the chat box. So, so uh, one point that uh, Dhabal, from your, your discussion only that, uh, that the virtual meeting and the technology part, and then that came about the cyber governance. So cyber governance has become so much important these days uh, uh, that uh, I was reading a report a few days back that uh, cyber crime is the second largest reported crime and uh, in damage inflicted uh, by this uh, cyber crime uh, is, uh, is is expected to reach 10 trillion by 2025 and this what this 10 trillion constitute is constitute mainly the ip theft business sensitive information theft, uh, theft price uh, sensitive information theft Opportunity cost due to disruption in service, cost of cyber insurance, brand reputation loss, and shareholder wealth erosion. So, so, so from the cyber governance perspective, uh, 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 may I request uh, Puja again to you, please? What, why do you think that cyber governance has become a high priority item in the board agenda in many organizations? And why I am asking this particular question, because most directors are not cyber security experts these days. And, uh, it, and I believe that, that the cyber security uh, should be the top down approach and board should take initiative to build culture around that. So what is your point of view there? Um, uh, thank you. I think, uh, like I said, the directors do not need to become cyber security experts, but we company secretaries, we need to. So from director's perspective, um, they they just need it. Um, they just need to have a macro perspective on what kind of cybersecurity policy they need to have. So they just need to focus on the impact on the risk or reputation or uh, what kind of business continuity plans they have. So they don't have to use the technical jargon to present what kind of detailed reports uh, uh, in terms of technology. They just need to have a general understanding of the security ecosystem, or what kind of relationships you have within, and um, you need to assess what kind of um, assess and address the risks that you face. So I think cybersecurity is not an IT problem. It involves the entire organization. Uh, there was a study conducted in uh, Stanford University which said that 88% of data breaches 
actually happened due to employee mistakes. So you can see it is not because the directors were not able to do, we uh, did a bad job at it. It just requires a mindset, a uh, shift in the mindset of the employees. And uh, from the Hong Kong perspective, I can say that uh, in 2019, there was a report published which said that data breaches in Hong Kong have reached, uh, have jumped to 80% in the last five years. So we will see a lot of uh, data privacy uh, laws um, and the, the regulators are getting rather more uh, teeth to take stricter actions against us. From the director's perspective, I can say that newer laws and regulations are coming in every day, newer um, responsibilities. And there is an increased liability from the board's perspective because uh, there could be um, a breach of duty of oversight of risk and security if there is any kind of uh, data breach. And the uh, that could land the directors into, you know, shareholders derivative suits. And from the cyber security perspective, I think the board just should focus on the risk and the reputation and the business continuity. Um, the other idea could be um, they can we can employ defensive layers, you know, just like um, you know, just like we used in the older times, so that if the first layer stops acting or is is compromised, the second layer or the third layer could be used. And this is just a common sense thing that we can use. We don't need to become IT expert. So um, I think right now, uh, as they say, data is the new oil. But I always believe oil is the new oil at the same time. So uh, from the cyber governance perspective, we do not need to think like IT people. We just need to think like people with uh, common sense. We just need to see how we can um, you know, uh, keep our assets protected. The other thing uh, could be just like a company, we can say that this is the type of policies, privacy policies or data protection policies I have. Uh, I think when we are using, um, because we are working in, a, in an international world, world and we have a lot of supply chains connected to us, we cannot simply say that, oh, I have these policies with me. I think we also need to demand those policies from our vendors, the same level, because our data is compromised if you are working with them. So this kind of uh, ecosystem that companies have built around themselves, uh, I think it, it is required that we uh, focus more uh, from the security perspective than the IT perspective from directors' point of view, because ultimately the liability will lie on the directors. They are, they are liable from the legal perspective. That's my opinion on this. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you very much. Abhijit, Abhijit sir, uh, do you want to add anything on the, what Pooja said and PK? No, just, just one line to add that, you know, one is the uh, technical part of it. The other is the GDPR, data protection uh, part of it. Because, you know, the kind of lawsuits that are coming is actually humongous because of uh, data being compromised, data being leaked, privacy not being maintained. So I'm more worried on GDPR than the technical. Technical wise, we try to do whatever is possible. We are, we ourselves as a group are in the cybersecurity business. We have acquired an American company, but then we are more worried on the data breach than anything else. This needs to be taken care of. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. PK, any, uh, your point of view, uh, you want to add anything? Uh, no, I pretty much uh, endorse what Pooja and uh, Abhijit stated. Of course, cybersecurity is a new uh, topic that has entered the boardroom agenda and it's become extremely important because particularly post-COVID when everything has gone digital. So, so digital and technology, while it facilitates and makes life simple, does bring a lot of risk. And I think boards uh, must... Uh, uh, consider these risks and I think the boards are uh, you see for example uh, many many boards have set up risk management committees and of course in India if you are a listed entity it's in any case uh, mandated to have uh, to have a RMC and uh, uh, SEBI has actually made it uh, even more tighter by asking uh, risk management committees to specifically look at cyber security risk uh, as one of the risks and the mitigation strategies uh, so what's very important is um, uh, it's a new phenomena. Uh, so obviously there needs to be resources and talent capacity building on this front, not just at the management level, but the board level also, because you need 
somebody who under, understands digital and technology risks. So probably uh, the boards might have to relook at their composition to see whether they have somebody who understands uh, these new age risks that will affect the company. Uh, and of course, put in interventions. Uh, possibly like we do fire drill, uh, companies would now be uh, wanting to be doing uh, you know, trial and errors, ethical hacking, interventions like ethical hacking. So those are interventions which companies will do. So uh, there is no foolproof uh, solution to this. You just keep um, relooking at interventions uh, at a very, very frequent interval uh, and then become better and better and better <coughs> and only hope that you will not be hit by a, a, a cyber security problem. I rightly said PK and uh about the cyber security and the top-down approach is the need of the hour and that's going on so thank you very much everybody for your time and your uh, your excellent insight of the topic that we discussed um, thank you everybody for uh, joining here and uh, is my humble request to our chairman T.S. Asis Garg for the for his uh, closing remark please thank you sir I think uh, this is one of the webinar which uh, I am also attending on a regular basis and I am listening to all the speakers normally what as a duty of the chairman I normally give the opening remarks and just uh, busy with the uh, other. The our best of the company secretaries from a different cities it's just like your best players of a cricket team is uh, playing from UK, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai and India and time is just uh, because when we have started we thought it two hours will be too much but now we have to skip the questions and we are uh, listening and watching all of you uh, on a continuous basis. And, and topic is such a uh, very good because I also just want to share one instance and uh, share uh, give the formal word of thanks because this digital era or the to hold the board meetings in a in a in this mode because I've been the Corona president because in 2020 when this Corona started on 16th of March and the complete lockdown it was a complete change no one has thought what will happen and to hold like a board meeting to hold a council meeting in a in a webinar mode such a difficult time uh, as a president as a company secretary as a council members because you have to give the equal opportunity to the council colleagues and to manage the 20 council members rather than the board of 15 it's really a herculous task so uh, so it's a different uh, uh, ball game altogether to hold the council meeting rather than the board meeting but a similar experience and a tough experience so all our company secretaries can think about it but yes my my heartiest uh, vote of thanks and uh, congratulations to all the panelists to uh, have this webinar in a, such a smooth way that no one has thought it it's a tea break and Abhijit sir definitely will share the tea and cookies um, to you in UK and excellent job by the moderator Raghavan ji uh, my thanks to Dhawal ji, PK and Pooja all of them to have this wonderful webinar and looking forward more such of webinars on a, on a, on such topics uh, on this international forum where all the members all the company secretaries from across the globe can connect um, on this time zone different and uh, something a time like 12 noon or 1 pm in india is something suitably to all of you uh, because to have this at uh, 3 or 4 pm indian time may be different time zone for uh, um, uh, for uh, something different so so uh, thank you so much um, all the panelists to wake up early prepare early <laughs> to be there till late evening and skip some of the important meetings on this Friday. So thank you so much once again from ICSI to all the panelists and all the uh, members who are watching this webinar across the globe. Thank you once again and looking forward to see you in more and more webinars and rather in a physical meetings whenever in India or in the other part of the country. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We are we are Thank really you. grateful you you attended the entire session. So, thank you very much, sir. And uh, 
and uh, and as you said uh, thank you to each each and every panelist and all of our audience who is sitting here and uh, uh, thanks to uh, the sonu sonu and team who are working working day and night and our it team who made this possible that the so short time and that conducted a very seamless without having any technological glitch on this so thanks to that team also thanks to everybody thank you very much thanks so thank much you. thank you